Okay, so good evening, and uh, I'm Frances Hellman. I'm chair of the physics department. Most of you I've, I've met over, the, over uh, the past year. But for tonight, I'd like to welcome you to the 22nd annual Emilio Segre Distinguished Lecture in Physics. Um, I want to note that this lecture series was made possible through the generosity of the Raymond and Beverly Sackler Foundation, and they're unfortunately not here tonight, but we really appreciate their make, enabling this, uh, this lecture. Um, we stay true to the Sackler's vision for this lectureship by bringing some of the physics' greatest minds and ideas, not just to the scientific community on campus, but to the greater community even of non-scientists. This is officially one of our two or three annual public lectures, and so I'd really like to welcome the non-physicists who are in the audience. So welcome, and, and we're glad to have you here. Tonight, I was going to make a comment that I've now learned is ent entirely inaccurate. Segre, of course, was a uh, distinguished um, scientist, distinguished experimental scientist, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, I'm not sure exactly what year. 1959, thank you. Um, and we were under the misapprehension that Millie was going to be the first woman Segre lecturer, which is, would have been an, it, it, a remarkably um, well, embarrassing statement to have to make, but it turns out it's not true. <laughs> so in fact, she is not the first woman Segre lecturer. In fact, well, there was one before, so I don't have to make that embarrassing statement. So in fact, she is a distinguished second woman lecturer. <laughs> 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 At any rate, I'm very, very happy that she's, that she's here uh, to give the lecture tonight. So uh, Millie is both a true physics legend, she's a pioneer, and she's somebody I have personally known for, well, over 20 years, I guess, something like that. So um, if I, you know, since what? Since, yes, yeah, since I was a graduate student, which is, yeah, like just a couple years ago or something. So, um, at any rate, if I were going to list her awards and honors and accomplishments, we wouldn't get to her lecture at all. So I'm really just going to hit a few of the high points. Um, Millie was actually born and raised in the Bronx, and originally, while at Hunter College, she was going to become an elementary school teacher. She was lucky enough to find a mentor, Rosalind Yallow, and that's the first time I actually knew that, who was a Nobel laureate in medicine and helped Millie realize that she had this enormous potential in physics. So I didn't know that. That, uh, that's an interesting background. She got her PhD from the University of Chicago, went and did a, an NSF-sponsored postdoc at Cornell, went to MIT's Lincoln Lab, where she met or just worked with her long-standing collaborator and husband, Jean Dresselhaus. Is that what you met? No, met before then. Okay, just worked with. Um, I heard that, in fact, she started there as a visiting professor with the intent of teaching um, undergrads in engineering who the theory was they needed to know more rigorous physics than they were being taught. So, but after a few years of being a visiting professor, she became a full professor there in 1968, and she stayed there ever since uh, with a really remarkable um, and distinguished distinguished research and teaching career in electronic materials. She's really been a leader not only in research, but also in promoting opportunities for women in science and engineering, and has been a mentor to a great many women in, in sciences. I actually know quite a few of the women scientists that she's um, introduced to the field and who are I now count as colleagues. Um, her, as for her awards and honors and prestigious positions, there, here's just a few of them. She was the president of the American Physical Society in 1984, president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1997, and head of DOE, Department of Energy, in 2000-2001. In 1973, she received a Carnegie Foundation grant to study and encourage women's roles in traditionally male-dominated fields, something else I didn't know till until somebody gave me all this information. Um, it's fascinating what you learn about people you think you knew. Um, she was named Institute Professor at MIT in 1985. She's been awarded, the nat now comes the honors and awards part, which is very abbreviated, I assure you. She's been awarded the National Medal of Science, the Heinz Award for Technology, the Economy for Technology, the Economy, and Employment, the Weizmann Institute's Millennial Lifetime Achievement Award, the Nicholson Medal from the American Physical Society, and most recently, the Buckley Prize, which is the high, pretty much the highest award in condensed matter physics that the American Phys Physical Society gives. That award was for her pioneering contributions to the understanding of electronic properties of materials, especially novel forms of carbon, and that's the work she's going to be telling us about tonight, but I can speak to the fact that this is work she has been uh, involved in for many, many, many years. So.
Well, it's really great being here uh, with many friends, some of which I just saw coming in. I hadn't seen them in some time, so I was really happy to see them in the audience. I was looking for some of these people at the reception. Oh. OK, so uh, I'm talking about why we are so excited about carbon nanostructures. And Frances helped me get this, this title, so I have to thank her too. So this is a Segray lecture. And uh, I was somewhat hard pressed to make my connection with Segray because we never met. But my husband knew him because he studied here at Berkeley as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. So I know a little bit about Segre through my husband, but not really too much. But we do have a common heritage that I'd like to tell you very briefly about. So it's on this view graph. So uh, that is Segre, picture of him in 1954. And so Enrico Fermi is the top entry on this uh, uh, view graph, even before Segre. And his lifespan is 1901 to 1954. During the period 1953 and 1954, I uh, knew uh, Fermi rather well. So uh, I, I was at Chicago, and he was there. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that. And Emilio Segre, and that's his lifespan, uh, he was the first graduate student of Enrico Fermi. And uh, then Segre has a big intersection with Berkeley because he came to Berkeley in 1938 on a fellowship where he was, he was already a professor, full professor in Italy. But he came here to learn some things and to use the wonderful facilities that were available here. What happened was that what in, during his first year after a few months, he lost his position in, in Italy, so he couldn't go back. Uh, they uh, expelled all the Jews from uh, faculty positions at that time, political reasons, so he became uh, an employee at Berkeley. So he stayed at Berkeley till 1943, then Los Alamos, then came back and spent roughly 35 years at, at, at UC Berkeley. And at the early time, 1959, he got his Nobel Prize. And um, it's interesting, when you go over his Nobel Prize lecture, he has this homage to uh, Enrico Fermi, which I'm going to read as the opening remarks, because some of the things he said are exactly what all students of Enrico Fermi say about Enrico Fermi. So, so that's our common heritage. And, so, and then I have one more view graph. I'll say a little bit, a few more things. So um, a quote from Segre's Nobel le Lecture, 1959. Uh, of Enrico Fermi, I would only say, quoting Dante, because he was a classical scholar, and so was, was Enrico Fermi, by the way. Uh, thou art my master and my author. Thou alone art he from whom I took the good style that had done me honor. So I'm speaking in a uh, um, humanities hall here, so this is appropriate thing <laughs> to say. And uh, now is uh, his heartfelt comment. I learned from him, and that's Fermi he's talking about, not only a good part of the physics I know, but above all, an attitude towards science which has affected all my work. And uh, of course, uh, Richard Feynman isn't around here to say that, but I've heard Richard Feynman say some similar things about his way he does physics. And uh, when in my early years, I heard Richard Feynman give a lecture. I thought it was Enrico Fermi speaking with a New York accent. <laughs> so, OK, that's um, our common heritage. And um, so I, this is my one slide of our common overlap. I wanted to make some commonality because for some people who are not in science who are in the audience, you might appreciate this part of my talk more than when, once I get into the science. So I'll give you a little break. 
So uh, Theory played a dominant role in physics education. We know him for the science he did. But I think that uh, Segre knew him more even for his teaching, education. And I know him more for his education. Of course, we have the Fermi surface and the Fermi level and Fermi statistics and all that. But when Fermi talked about it, his name was never mentioned because he was very modest about those kinds of things. So uh, every place he went, uh, he had a dramatic effect on the education system. And I would say that of any physicist I know, he had the biggest effect on how we do physics today, at least in this country, how it's taught in the graduate programs. So I mean, some of you are much too young to know that. But those who knew him uh, would, I think, agree with me on this. Uh, everybody had a special place. They felt that they had a special place with Fermi. Um, with um, Emilio Segre, he was called the Basilisco. And um, before I even knew uh, Segre's full name, I knew he was the Basilisco. And Basilisco is a person that when they look at you, they look very penetratingly, and then you fall dead. Then, <laughs> so uh, I didn't know what a Basilisco was when, when he told me about Segre. But some people around here understand this, what, what Basilisco meant and Segre. My special place with him, everybody had a special place. I know what my special place was. So uh, I was six weeks, not months, but six weeks older than his daughter. And I was in physics. And so in the morning, I was an early person. He was an early person. We often would see each other, and as he would be riding on his bike, and he would see me, he would get off his bike, pedal his bike, walking, and he would talk to me about something, usually physics, but anything. So that was my, I felt that was my special place. I never knew why he did this, but during the year that we were together, when I, from the time I arrived until his passing, uh, we had this relation. So uh, Fermi started his day early. He always taught 8 o'clock classes. And let me say, I heard that you have 8 o'clock classes at Berkeley. I just heard that walking down here. Um, Fermi was a person that actually packed his classroom at 8 o'clock. If you wanted to get a lecture from Fermi, you were there at 8 o'clock, or you didn't get the lecture from Fermi. Because he started his day very, very early, and before he ever got to the lab, he had three hours or so of physics before he ever arrived. And then after his class, the day was given to graduate students, visitors, everybody coming in until the evening time. So uh, that was his day. Um, and he did a lot of physics, as you know. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more as I go through the view graph. Uh, uh, he believed that teaching freshman physics is the greatest opportunity and challenge of an academic physicist. And he taught that to all of us that studied with him. And I believed it. And I did a lot of teaching of freshmen when I was at Chicago. And, uh, and I've been sort of continuing that in, in engineering school at MIT to, the, to our undergraduates. So teaching physics uh, meant present, presenting the most fundamental uh, topics in physics, whether it was beta decay or some nuclear reaction or whatever. Uh, in a way that was very simple, stripped of any complications uh, with the essentials that could essentially fit on the back of an envelope. He had in his, in his shirt pocket always a bunch of little envelopes. And if he re read a physical review article or talked to somebody that had something interesting to say, he would jot down five lines in his pocket, and that would be the, the, the topic. So, and he taught us that way, too. So class notes were provided to everybody. And many of you have seen his class notes. They're absolute gems. He has thermodynamics. He has nuclear physics, has quantum mechanics. And they're available, all written in his handwriting. And uh, he used to give us the handwritten notes that he would mimeograph himself before class. Um, that was the, and he didn't want us to write, because that was distracting to him. He spoke very, very slowly. Uh, uh, I don't know about Segre, whether he was fast or slow. 
but Enrico Fermi was very, very slow. And uh, each lecture ended with a problem <coughs> that sounded very simple when you, when you got the problem, you wrote it down, and when you went home to do it, you found out that this lecture that was so simple was really had so much depth, and there was all this stuff that you didn't understand, but when, after you did the problem, you understood a lot more. So <coughs> that was class with him. And the idea of taking a course was to prepare you to do physics in any subfield of physics that was current at that time. That's what his goal was. And the exam that we had to pass to enter the doctoral program sort of tested us on all current fields of physics. So um, I, will, I will return to that point. Uh, students were expected to come up with their own thesis topic. Well, and in those days it was possible. Nowadays that would be very difficult because we're doing too many complicated things, too much complicated equipment. But that was the idea. And the thesis consisted of uh, papers refereed and published in the physical review or similar journals. There was no thesis defense. There was a thesis defense, but it was on published work. So that was kind of the idea. And uh, so my um, intersection with Emilio Segre is we had the same patron saint, so to speak. And uh, he believed that we should all understand each other's physics. And every, all the different subfields should come to the physics colloquium. And he would sit in the front seat on the left-hand side like that. And he would always ask a few very penetrating questions that you could answer on the back of an envelope. But the speakers that were giving the lecture couldn't always answer the questions. I remember that as a graduate student. It was a little bit embarrassing. We also had Edward Teller, who was uh, there at the same time. And we had another guy called Ed Adams. And between the three of them, it was a devastating situation to be a speaker at the <laughs> University of Chicago uh, uh, colloquium. But people still like to come because they like to interact with him. So uh, because everybody should understand each other's physics, uh, since I'm in condensed matter and Emilio Segre was a nuclear high energy physics at the time, I think it's OK that Francis invited me. So I justified my presence in that context. And uh, I would like to say that for those of you who don't know, um, Enrico Fermi actually published seminal papers at the cutting edge of every single field current in, in physics at the time of his life. And even computational physics, which was just a very beginning field, and maybe his paper was the very first paper in the field, as there was Fermi, uh, Pasta, and Ulam uh, about uh, cyclic, cyclic solutions of, um, of oscillating nonlinear equations. And that was done on a computer at that time. So amazing. OK, enough said. And that's our common heritage. I hope you don't mind that I try to cover some historical ground here, uh, because some of the younger students probably are not aware of this aspect of our heritage, common heritage. Now I'm going to talk about what I've been doing and a little bit from a historical perspective. So I started uh, working in this field. Um, now we know it as graphite, uh, nanotubes, fullerenes, all kind of forms of carbon that I've worked on. But it all starts with uh, graphene, which was rediscovered in, uh, in 2004. But I was kind of working in here at the very beginning when I started in this uh, subfield after my uh, PhD and postdoc. Oh, uh, let me just explain how I got in this field. I wasn't planning to talk about this, but somebody in the introduction, I think it was you, Francis, or, or up in the, in the uh, room before, uh, asked me a little how I got here. So uh, after I, I did my um, PhD and postdoc and got my first job, it was really hard to get a job at that time because of nepotism rules. And so uh, uh, I wound up at Lincoln Lab. Um, with my husband, Gene Dresselhaus. And so we both got jobs there because uh, MIT didn't have a nepotism rule. It was one of the two places in the country that didn't. So we, we could get jobs there. That was good. But the negative part was I had to change fields. They told me, anything you knew, we didn't want you to work on this anymore. 
So um, they wanted me to work in high field uh, magneto optics, which I didn't know anything about. So, uh, so I had to learn a new field. That was fine. It was the best thing that happened in my life. So, um, so quickly, you know, I, I had this good Fermi training that I could learn anything, right? Any field of physics, so something close like that should be able to do. So I did. And, um, but everybody was working in semiconductors. That seemed kind of a little bit boring. And I'll tell you how I got around this as I evolved. So here is graphene. So that's carbon. It's not a semiconductor. So um, graphene is just a single sheet, one atom thick of carbon. And it's uh, one millionth as thick as a sheet of paper. So it's really thin. For people that aren't scientists, you can't imagine how thick. It's the thinnest thing in nature. And you can fashion it. If you cut it out with these little green things and roll it up, you get a fullerene, C60 molecule. That looks like a soccer ball. Or you can take like the red sheet and roll it up, as indicated, and you get a cylinder, and that's a carbon nanotube, 1D, one dimension. Or you could stack these little bits, and you can make graphite. So that's known in nature. You could go to the, a mine and, and actually mine it. Or you can have a graphene ribbon. Uh, my uh, current talk today, everybody was asking me questions about that. That's the latest fad. So here's a graphene ribbon, one dimensional thing. So we have all of these forms nowadays. And um, I was attracted to this field um, when I had to make a decision in 1960 what I was going to work on. And so I decided I wanted to do this. And what attracted me is that the dispersion relations are linear in momentum. And in, in our field of condensed matter physics, this almost never happens. Everything is quadratic. And here was something that behaved totally different, that the valence and conduction bands are degenerate at this point, this k point. So it had such a uniqueness and actually beauty to me. I thought this is something I wanted to do. And uh, I got the idea of working on this actually through Berkeley. And, uh, and I just remembered this uh, in, in thinking about giving this talk uh, uh, early this morning. Um, my husband w worked here with Charlie Cattell. He did his PhD thesis. They did cyclotron resonance in semiconductors. But they also looked at graphite, because graphite was sort of a semi-metal, but it had a very low mass. So they looked at that. And he knew that that was a material that would be novel and interesting, and I could do magneto optics. But every, they wanted me to work on magneto optics. And I didn't want to work on semiconductors like everybody else. I wanted to do my own thing. So he suggested this to me. So Berkeley had a big part in my career. So yay for Berkeley. <laughs> Go Bears or something, <laughs> as you say. OK. So, uh, a, real, a classmate of mine at the University of Chicago, just, uh, just prior to 1960, had developed, and his name, Joel McClure, down here, uh, he had worked out the electronic structure of graphite in 1957, band structure, electronic structure. And in 1960, he wrote a paper where he put in the magnetic field. So the magnetic field basis of, of the experiments I was going to do just popped up just at the right time for me. And the other thing that happened in 1960 was materials. You know, in, in our field, condensed matter physics, materials are really important. And before the time of 1960, it would have been a very difficult to do the experiment that I did, that I'm going to describe to you very briefly here. Uh, but um, hi, um, highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, HOPG, was produced by the, for the first time in 1960 in the UK. And I happened to know about this. And I got them to make a sample for me. Actually, it was made at General Electric Lab uh, in Schenectady, New York. And so I had a unique sample. I had a unique theory. And I had a unique idea, I guess. And my unique idea was to do the following thing. So I, I had magnetic fields. So these are the energy levels, valence band and conduction band magnetic field. 
So for high energy physics, you can just think about this as energy levels, sort of like hydrogen atom, if you want. And um, then going into the K point here, so the K point is right here in, in reciprocal space, right, the center of this um, Fermi surface. And then I had the H point is at the top of the Brouin zone. And the, the energy levels go in with zero slope. This, this lecture is not going to be all that complicated, uh, so you don't have to worry. I'm just giving you a few details for the science community that uh, in solid state, so you'll understand. This was the first experiment ever done where we were able to look at whole regions of the Brouin zone rather than a point. So it was interesting for solid state for that purpose. And so uh, from this experiment of doing a transitions between these energy levels in the magnetic field from the valence to the conduction band um, in this region of reciprocal space and this region of reciprocal space, we were able to get a good picture of the electronic structure of graphite for the, really for the first time. So because I had the band model and I had a sample, so everything worked out well. So, um, the best experiment that we did during this period was done with a laser. This is the first experiment ever done with a laser in the magneto optics. And I got Ali Javan, who is the inventor of the CW laser. He was a faculty member at MIT. And uh, M I used to work at the magnet lab, so we were kind of classmates. And I asked him if he could make a, a, a help us make a, a, a laser with circularly polarized light. So this is the first of its kind that was ever made. And we were able to study left and right circularly polar polarized light. And if you look here at the spectrum here, uh, one of them is plus polarization, the other one's minus polarization. You see that the transitions like 5, 4, and 4, 5 occur at, at different uh, 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 magnetic fields. And these even more different magnetic fields, 3, 4, and 4, 3. And what that showed us is uh, the sign of the carriers and where they were located in the Brouin zone. And in fact, uh, before that time, the uh, holes and electrons were mislocated. So this experiment that we did with the polarized light first, uh, for the first time identified electrons and holes in the Brouin zone. And uh, uh, so all the work past 1968 when this paper was published have the correct identification, and those before have the incorrect identification. Um, this is important because many of the cyclotron resonance experiments and other such res uh, experiments were done in this earlier period. So they're backwards from what we know today. So you have to look with little care. So I was doing all this, and uh, so people got to know that we uh, were finding out something about the band structure of a very elementary thing, just carbon in the uh, graphite form. And um, so people at Bell Labs, Hene and um, also uh, uh, Ted Jabal, he was a co-author on this paper, they discovered at, at, at uh, Bell Labs a superconductivity in an intercalation compound. So an intercalation compound has a single sheet of, of graphite. So it's just graphene, one layer thick. And then there were atoms put between them. So there were potassium atoms and, so, and um, uh, rubidium atoms and so forth. Uh, and we had a stack like this. And they discovered superconductivity. And uh, so they got in touch with me and convinced me that I should start working on intercalation compounds because I knew something about the electronic structure and they thought that I could figure out how come this thing goes superconducting. So uh, this sort of launched me into this, this field. Um, it actually took me a few years to, to get there because I couldn't get any funding to work in this field. You know that story. We know that very well nowadays, right? So, uh, uh, oops. Um, but I, in 1973, I, I managed to get a, a, a chair, a MIT chair. So I had a little funds, and that fund allowed me to do this experiment on my own funds. And, and then uh, once we showed a few things, you know, it, it opened the spigot like it does nowadays. Once you get some result, they actually believe you that, that you can do something. So 
So we started working in intercalation compound. Now, I mention this because this is my first nanoworld nano experiment because there was just one atom thick. So this is my beginning in nano. And I've been in nano ever since. So I started nano and in, into nano through this Tejabal introduction. Tejabal was Francis Hellman's mentor for her PhD. So we have some common roots with, right there. OK, so um, anyway, the intercalation, um, not everything intercalates. So we uh, try to introduce other, the other materials through ion implantation and with a laser. And we, so we tried all kinds of things. And this led to a, an interesting experiment of uh, uh, using a laser to melt carbon. Carbon is the highest melting point a material in nature. It melts about 4,500 degrees uh, C. Uh, so if you want to melt carbon, you have to melt carbon in carbon. So you have a laser that makes a little puddle of liquid carbon inside solid carbon, and that forms the container. So that's the experiment we did. We made a puddle of liquid carbon and studied the properties, and in fact showed that it was metallic, which is what we thought. But not everybody thought it would be metallic. It was a big fight about that at the time, and this settled. But uh, when we did this, the following thing happened. Our clothes got dirty. Every time we worked on this experiment, we used to get black looking clothes. And the walls sort of got a little sooty. So we were trying to figure out after this what was happening. So there was a lot of soot coming off the sample. And then we, made a, we measured how many atoms of carbon came off for a certain amount of energy put in with the laser. And we found that about a, a chunk of 100 atoms or so were coming off the uh, rod at one time. And at that time, people only thought that like two and C2 and two C3 were coming off. So the big experts at that time were at, at Exxon Research Lab. Now, uh, Exxon Research Lab is an oil company. And of course, they're interested in, in things like chemistry and, and materials and clusters and, and carbon systems. Uh, and they were studying clusters up to C15. So I went to talk to them. I said, you know, uh, we have something that's something like C100. Why don't you extend these measurements and try much bigger chunks? So then next year, I saw this paper come out. And this very famous paper in, in, in uh, solid state physics. I don't know how many thousands of citations it has. And there's a big peak here at C60 and another peak at C70. And they published this, but they didn't identify it. And then Smalley and Curl and Croto, they came around and the year after. And that's fullerenes. So that was the beginning of fullerenes. It was an exciting thing. So um, now I got into this business a different way. Uh, I went to a conference, and there was a guy at this conference called Endo, Morinobo Endo. And he had discovered a way to make carbon fibers. So this is my second entry into nanocarbon. And uh, he was showing us that, that these wonderful um, fibers were very um, graphitic. And uh, so I said to him, let's go look at this some more. Let's try to do some transport measurements, and let's try to do some spectroscopy. So he, he made me some samples, and we started doing uh, something. And then the Army got really interested, and they got, got us to write a book uh, here on carbon fibers, graphite fibers, it's called, um, uh, because uh, of the importance of this, both to the space program and to defense things. So uh, and, and the literature was terrible. The students could never understand any of the articles. So we wrote this book. This is my entry into book writing, because we've written a number of books. And this is the first one. We wrote this for the um, a military, US military, yeah. And so I was out at this end. And then the military, they had a meeting in, in just before Christmas in 1990. And so I was out here with this. And, they, they, and the center of these carbon fibers was a little thing that was stuck out. And that was a, a multi-wall nanotube. And the center of a carbon fiber is a multi-wall nanotube. And then uh, Smalley was invited to the same conference to talk at C60. And at the end of the conference, they put the two of us on the stage like this, and one end and the other end. And they said, what's related between your work? And we didn't know it was related, so we were fantasizing 
that it was something like this. But none of these things, well, this was sort of known, but this wasn't known. This is fantasy, and this is even more fantasy. So this is a carbon nanotube. That if, suppose you could make that, that would relate this thing and what's at the inside of a carbon fiber. Maybe somebody could make that, but you know, this is really pretty far-fetched. So we were talking about this, and this led to um, this paper. So in 1992, before anybody had made a single wall nanotube, um, uh, our group, and uh, we had two visitors, Saito and Fujita. And they were both very, very young Japanese people that had fellowships from the Japanese government to get education. And they wound up at MIT. And Saito was visiting our group. And um, Fujita was visiting uh, Patrick Lee's group. I mean, some of you will know who these people are. And, uh, but Fujita liked this problem, so he spent a lot of time with us. And he wrote this paper and a few other papers with us that year. So uh, this was now in now theory, but no experiment and no hope. We didn't have any idea anybody could ever make this at the time. But if somebody could make it, this would be pretty interesting stuff. Why? And uh, this is why. Because we predicted at that time that so we have, here's, here's a, a graphene sheet. And if you roll it up to make this kind of a nanotube, uh, then you would have a situation where these cutting lines, these, these are the allowed states on a one-dimensional system on this two-dimensional um, uh, surface that pertains to graphene. But when you roll it up to make a nanotube, you just get these allowed state very many fewer. And if a loud state happened to go through this apex point, we would have a metallic state. Otherwise, it would be semiconducting. Well, nobody believed this for six years. And so I would try to talk to people about it. And even after the nanotubes were discovered, so here's the nanotubes being discovered, 1993. So this is a year later. Uh, and uh, two people did this, uh, Bethune at IBM, uh, San Jose and uh, Ijima and NEC labs, so both industrial labs, in fact, both the same year, back-to-back -back publications in Nature magazine. And uh, so here's the single wall nanotube. And they had um, TEM identification of which tube they had. So uh, by the way, the different notation than we use today. So don't go by. We don't use that notation. Today you get confused if you look at that, that old paper. So now I'm going to tell about adventures with carbon nanotubes that I had. Because so well now we have nanotubes and single wall nanotubes. So I was right there. So I was working right in, in that area. So, uh, so we had one book. Then um, this is uh, another book. Not the second book. There's a third book, because there was one in fullerenes in between. But here's the nanotube book. Uh, because the people at Bell Labs said I was getting old. And this was about time that I do more service to, to, to our community. And they liked the books I had had up till that time. They said I was good for explaining things in a simple way. So that's our Fermi heritage again. You know, I learned that from Fermi, five lines. And so, OK, so that's what we were doing. And it was really useful because one thing we emphasized in our book was notation. Uh, so now everybody has the same notation. It would have been terrible in the field if everybody used their own notation because there are many ways of describing these, setting the notation for nanotube. So we had uh, the A1 and the A2 unit vectors. And that's how we describe the nanotubes. Everybody does it now, because we had a book with a nice cover, a pretty cover. So <laughs> they went and bought it. And it was very cheap. So that's another thing you want to do, almost give the books away. So. OK, so, um, and, uh, so this, this vector here forms the uh, chiral vector. And then we roll up the tube with the chiral vector. And that determines the diameter. And the chiral angle is the angle that the chiral vector makes with the uh, green arrow, which is the A1 vector. So we have a notation. And every you could see that the nanotube is formed by joining point O with any corresponding point on this whole map. And if you want to get out to, say, 2 nanometers, there are about 200 ways to do this. You can imagine, fantasize that in your mind. So there are 200 ways to do that. And every one has a slightly different diameter, according to this formula. 
and different chiral angle. And every one of them will have their unique energy levels. OK, you're going to remember this. Every NM nanotube, we call this NM nanotube, NM nanotube, has its own energy levels. That is very important, because I'm going to tell you more about this. So the nanotubes uh, very soon um, had special properties. Well, their properties were really not that unique, because carbon fibers had most of these properties. But that was sort of a military thing. What nanotubes was more civilian, and, and it was more kind of um, uh, sexy, though people were talking about it. And so OK, with very small size, that, that's unique for the nanotubes. And now we have graphene ribbons, even just small. Electronic properties, very, very strange. They could be either metallic or semiconducting. All you have to do is wrap them in a different way, different diameter. That was amazing to everybody. They didn't believe it for years. Six years it took before people believed it. So and mechanical properties, just like um, um, the carbon fibers, that was not different, hardly different. And many new physics things, and that kept Steve Louis busy and other people. Marvin Cohen, and was, people at Berkeley did a great deal in this field. And, and we were working on single molecule spectroscopy. That's one of our contributions to the field. So um, in 1996, Smalley had, uh, made for the first time enough uh, samples so we could do experiments. Well, not only we, the whole community. And he made us a sample to do Raman. He was convinced that Raman would be interesting, so he made a sample. who was a co-author on this paper. So um, as I was explaining, the, each nanotube has a, a unique signature. It has its own set of cutting lines. And the separation between adjacent cutting lines is twice, two over the diameter. So that selects diameter. And the uh, direction that these cutting lines, as you see over here, cutting lines, uh, what the uh, orientation of that compared to the crystalline axis, like uh, uh, gamma um, km, for example. Uh, that determines the chiral angles. So uh, we have uniqueness there. And every nanotube has its own uh, energy levels. And they can be measured here. So uh, the experiment showed that we had this radial breathing mode. This is a unique signature of a nanotube. And it's for all the atoms on the tube vibrating in and out in the radial direction in a homogeneous way, A1 symmetry for the experts. So uh, you'll notice that every one of these traces taken at a different laser excitation energy has a different frequency. It's labeled, so you could see it's different, and very different intensity. And that tells us this is a resonant process. So uh, the resonant process has to do with these spikes in the density of states that are so associated with one-dimensional systems. One-dimensional systems have these spikes, and that means that if the energy, if you're making a transition from this point to that point, because the density of states is so huge at the incident and final states, uh, the intensity of this um, a transition will be very, very large, will be amplified by hundreds of thousands of times. So you get a huge in, in, in increase in intensity. So, um, so we have the energy, and that's because this is a resonant process. And the, a radial breathing mode gets the diameter of the tube. So we have two things. And we need to determine n and m. So you could see we have two, two unknowns that have to do with the geometry of the tube. And there are two things we measure. And we figured out a way how to relate these two so we can do geometrical determination from spectroscopy. So that's what basically came out of this experiment, first experiment done on the, uh, with Raman on the the second experiment, I had a visitor uh, coming um, the year after we did that first experiment, Marcus Pimenta from Brazil. He was on sabbatical. And he was looking for an interesting problem. So I said, let's look at metallic tubes. And so we did semiconducting and, and metallic tubes. And we found, to our amazing amazement, that the Raman spectra had very different line shapes. So you see over here one line shape. So then you see over here a different line shape. And then over here again, another line shape. So here are all the points that you can have 
um, from um, the unique points from the NM diagram. So here's a plot of the transition energies that I was showing for the resonant process as a function of diameter of the tubes. So the first is a semiconducting tubes, the second is semiconducting tubes, and then we have metallic tubes, and then we have semiconducting ones again. The diameter range of the sample that we got from Smalley was down in this range. So as we increase the um, laser excitation energy, we would hit these semiconducting tubes, get this line shape. And then we get into this region, we had metallic tubes, and we had this line shape. And back here, we get into semiconducting tubes, and we had that line shape. And we were really astonished by that. And we came and we said that this was maybe due to plasmons. I guess we, people don't believe in plasmons anymore. Now they have electron-phonon interaction. That's probably better explanation. But that was what we had in these early 10 years ago. So you're not always right on all points. Well, we, we admit defeat here. Um, but it, this whole experiment gave us the idea that, that we had such a large uh, signal, and they were so distinct, maybe we could do uh, the experiment just on one nanotube at a time. So we, uh, uh, Charlie Lieber at, at um, uh, Harvard made us a sample. We didn't have a clue how to make the sample. We needed a chemist. And so uh, he vapor, chemical vapor deposition, he deposited individual tubes, his, one of his postdocs did, actually. And they did it in a very uh, sparse way, so these tubes were really separated from each other. And so we could do spectroscopy on one tube. And so here is results that, that we got from a metallic tube and a semiconductor, one, one metallic tube and one semiconducting tube. And this is the radial breathing mode over here, RBM, radial breathing mode. And that's the, how the atoms are going in the radial direction. And I'd like to call your intensity to the huge, uh, your attention to the in huge intensity that we got from this. It was, we were really astonished. So this is just one tube. And it's sitting on a silicon surface that has a million times more silicon atoms than the carbon atoms that are in resonance. And the signal from the silicon is just about the same level as the carbon. That's 10 to the minus 6 less in number. So that tells you that one-dimensional physics is really, nanophysics is very interesting. It has uh, features that, that you're not expecting. Um, and then we have all these other uh, things, the, the G-band, which is the ordinary graphite. It's very different for semiconducting and metallic tubes. My lecture today for the uh, condensed matter physics uh, community, I was talking about recent work that we're doing on these things for the differences between metallic and semiconducting tubes. At this time, we just knew that they were different. But now we're getting into the science of it, thanks to people like Steve Louie and company that tell, have shown us what the physics behind these differences uh, are. So we were doing all of this. And, um, and then we also work on these bundles, because that helps us to uh, uh, help the community understand their samples. So we have radial breathing mode. That gives us the diameter distribution of samples. You have a lot of different peaks, and that tells you what you have. And this is a disorder that you have in your sample, because that's symmetry broken um, uh, feature. If you have a perfect crystal, you, this peak doesn't appear. And this is uh, the G band, and it's different for this graphite band. It's different for semiconducting as compared to metallic tubes. You could see big difference. Line width, line shape, everything. And then we had this feature here that was kind of in, in mystery until uh, we started working with nanotubes, although you, we could see this in other systems. We didn't have an idea, really, uh, what the origin of that is very well. And that's a double resonance phenomenon that probes the electronic structure by looking at the phonons. And since that time, we made a lot of progress in understanding that. And this feature, in fact, is the uh, key way that we identify graphene today. So all this work that we did on nanotubes has paid off in the graphene world that I'm going to tell you about at the end of my lecture. So uh, we were doing single nanotube spectroscopy. And then uh, the people at Rice, they wanted to join the act. So they found single uh, emission spectroscopy. So this is emission from single tubes. But they could have all their tubes in the same pot. They had a fluid, and the, and the tubes were all swimming around. 
But if you do emission spectroscopy, you can observe all the spectra or collect all the different light at once. So uh, here's the collection. So here's excitation on this axis and emission. So you collect this whole batch of tubes, many different tubes. Each one of them is a single NM tube. But you can look at them all at once. So that was a really big advance. And when they did this, they found a few things in the physics that really surprised the whole world. So for one thing, uh, these lines are all curved. And they call that the family effect. Nobody was expecting family effects. Because with this emission process, they looked at very small diameter tubes. With the Raman spectra, we never looked at those tubes. We didn't have those available. But they did. Uh, because they're chemists, so they made them specially. And you can really only see them well with the emission process. So their process works like this. They took a nanotube, and they dressed it in a surfactant. So each tube was isolated from every other tube. So we could have a long excitation lifetime. And so that long lifetime allowed the emission to be collected. Because if you had the tube swimming around like this in bundles, then they would interact with each other, and they would decay before you could see the light coming out. So um, this is what they made. And that sort of revolutionized the field. So you could do wrapping agents. And uh, the experiment that they did was they had excitation at, from the second level. And then in some internal process would take place. And emission took place between the first levels. And that's what's plotted here. And so the first thing was we got these families. And the second thing is that the ratio of energy of these second levels to the first levels, uh, we thought before this was a factor of two. But when they actually measured, it wasn't two, but it was 1.8. And what that told us is that the physics that we, was, we, we were, had been using to understand all these phenomena was not complete. There was many body effects. And people like Steve Louie and his company, they got really busy at that time trying to understand the spectra and explaining this. And they did. And um, uh, back at MIT, we were very anxious to make use of this so we can continue with our, our spectroscopy work. And we had a student, Georgie, who is now a postdoc at, at Berkeley, uh, did this for, as part of his thesis. So he. Um, got for us this Kataro plot that I showed you before, which is energy transition energies versus diameter. And um, you could see that we don't have straight lines, but we have these curly loops family behavior. So uh, we've been using this for all spectroscopy ever since. It's very, very handy. So that was an advance that was made. And at Columbia University, they made, a, and Berlin, two places, they made another big discovery that the behavior was excitonic. We didn't have excitons before. Nobody was thinking about excitons in, in these condensed matter, metallic, sort of semi-metallic systems. Um, but the crucial experiment was to do a, two fo a photon experiment. So we have photon one and photon two. If it was a band state, then we would have this picture. We'd go from the valence to conduction band, and the emission would be the same for energy. But the experiment showed that it wasn't the same energy. Here's the experiment. So that the um, uh, excitation was the blue, and the emission was the red. And they're certainly not the same energy. They're shifted by about 300 millivolts. So uh, we found out that at that time that this picture was the correct one, this excitonic picture. And, and we've been using that ever since. So we, um, every time something happened that changed our thinking, and we had readjusted. But it's very, very interesting that all the spectroscopy that we did was valid. And, it, and it, well, this is kind of a fluke, because all the, all the excitons, there are actually four excitons that are involved. I'm not getting into this detail. But it is one exciton, but there are four of them. Three of them are dark. One of them is light. And if you make a, a theory for the light exciton, the one that actually gives off light, it fits all the experimental data that we ever saw. So that the experimental crowd, they were still pretty happy. They could use all the results that they had. They just call them excitons now and reinterpret everything they did in terms of an excitonic picture. And that, that might be a little bit simplification over what happened. But I think for a general audience, um, uh, it's kind of a, a nice uh, uh, ending to this picture 
that we were able to capitalize on all the work that had been done before, just understand it in a better way. And uh, here at Berkeley, they did a lot of work in this area. We did some work also at, at MIT. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Professor Flemings, I didn't happen to see him or his students around, but they contributed a great deal to this um, uh, time-resolved spectroscopy. And I show here some phonon-assisted, uh, both in the frequency domain, and you get all of these phonons. Every phonon that you know about in, in the carbon system shows up as a phonon-assisted process. And then uh, you can also look at it in the, in the time domain. So we did some uh, preliminary work, and then the Berkeley group did a lot of work on this to clarify um, lifetimes. Now I move to my last topic, except for just looking to the future. And this is about graphene. So this is my last uh, carbon form. And um, so graphene revisited 2004. That's only four years ago, not very long ago. So uh, this is the latest, uh, not, maybe not exactly the latest, because we also have linear chains of carbon atoms that came along a little maybe after this. But, but let's say this is the latest. Not, not too much work has been done on carbon chains, so we'll leave that one out. I don't have new graphs on it. But um, so we're back to graphene. That, I open the lecture with graphene. I end the lecture with graphene. So here's this, this sheet, and I explained about all of these things. And in 2004, somebody actually made a single sheet because uh, people didn't think you could make a single sheet. Uh, so that was uh, the Gein group in um, Manchester, UK, and uh, the Columbia group, Kim, at, at uh, Columbia. So um, I'm, I'm only going to talk about a very small subset of this, and I'm just going to talk about the ribbons part. So you imagine you have the big sheet, but then we could cut up ribbons. And I was talking about that for the uh, uh, specialist lecture in the afternoon. So there were two kinds of sim uh, uh, main kinds of, of, of ribbons. Here's a, a zigzag ribbon. You see zigzag around the edge? And then we have the armchair red ribbon. And these are the uh, uh, stable forms. Uh, uh, ribbons are different than nanotubes. They're similar to nanotubes because they're one dimensional. Nanotubes are one dimensional. This is one dimensional. So they have that similarity. And I'll show you some more similarities that they have. But um, um, ribbons only have two kinds of, of chiralities predominantly. They don't have much of the intermediate that there, you can go between this one and this, and there's a 60 degree, uh, uh, no, 30 degree difference between uh, those two. But, um, you could think that you can have all the different uh, chiralities like you have with nanotubes, but that doesn't uh, appear in the ribbons. So um, if you look, the uh, one thing that you can say uh, from a very simple point of view is that for the zigzag ribbons um, that I showed in the previous view graph, they all have a very high density of states at the Fermi level. The Fermi level is the demarcation in energy between the valence and conduction band. And usually that's sort of a point, but in, in, in graphene, it has this whopping big singularity in the density of states. So that makes it kind of interesting and different and gives mag magnetic properties to uh, uh, these systems. So zigzag uh, ribbons are magnetic. Armchair ribbons, in contrast, can either be metallic if N, N was the label, here, go back to this view graph. N is the number of columns that you have, one, two, three, four, and then going up to N, that labels how many columns you have. That's what N is. So um, if N is divisible by three, modulo three minus one, then we have a metallic uh, uh, ribbon and conducts electricity. For the other two uh, chiralities that you can have, um, 3m and 3m minus to the system is semiconducting. So in that sense, it's a little bit like, like nanotubes, because nanotubes has the same kind of relation. Uh, but it doesn't have all the chiralities. You only have these two. So uh, similarities and differences, uniquenesses and similarities. Um, experimental verification for this comes from not a very good uh, edge, but zigzag edge lights up compared to armchair edges. So 
that's what you're supposed to see here. And so that, because we have this high density of states, so high density of states should mean more states that we have so they can light up. And so these are early works. See, we didn't know about Geim and, and Kim, and we were doing our own experiments in spectroscopy at the same, and with, with these graphenes. Uh, we call them nanographite. We didn't have the same name for it. We call them nanographite, so they did, could, didn't read our papers, so they didn't know about us. But it was the same thing, single layer of graphene we were making. But we were making it by a different route. We are making it from nano diamond, so different way. And he, anyway, there was a student, um, uh, this is a Saito student, who predicted that there would be nodes for certain directions of polarization. And so we made these ribbons to check whether that theory was correct. So uh, the way this experiment works is we have this strip of graphene sitting on a graphite surface. So you'd think that um, it would be impossible, carbon and carbon, how could we ever look at the spectra? Well, the reason, the way, way this thing works is like this. Uh, the uh, ribbon is this curve, and the background is this curve. So why is it different? The little strip that we had sitting on the, on the graphite got very hot because the um, thermal conductivity of graphite is highly anisotropic. It conducts heat extremely well in plane, but almost not at all in perpendicular to the plane. So when the laser hit the little um, a ribbon, the ribbon got very hot, and its frequency went down, as you could see here. But the substrate was big, so it had high thermal conductivity and remained at room temperature. So it had a different frequency. So we could separate the frequencies. And then we did this polarization experiment. So this is the ribbon, and that's the background, the uh, uh, substrate sitting on it. And you can see that stays about the same. And this ribbon thing goes down to 0. So we re verified the node. So that was kind of first experiment. And that was at the time that they were discovering the graphene at, at Manchester. But it was a different process that they were making their graphene. Here's another experiment we did. And um, so we have an edge, armchair and zigzag edge, 150 degrees between these. And so when we come in with the laser, we move across like that. And we move across like that. And we do the spectra. And you could see that when we move across the armchair, that's one, we get a big disorder-induced peak. But when we move across the zigzag edge, it's very much smaller. And when we're interior at the point 0.3, we get nothing. So uh, what that shows is that edge is, is, has some disorder. Okay, The edges that we were making at that time weren't as good as the edges we make today. And that's two, uh, four years ago. And, um, and symmetry makes, makes the two cases different, because the wave vector for the armchair fits very nicely between the k and the k prime point. So it's easy to make that transition. So this is, becomes a symmetry breaking mode. But there's no phonon that connects these according to symmetry. So this should be 0. And it's only something because the edge is not very good. But you could see a big difference between these two edges. Lots of people tried this experiment, and they weren't able to do it, because you have to have a pretty good edge to even see this, this well. So that's distinguishing two different edges. And this is what we, the recent work, Maybe no lights would be good here, but you'll have to imagine. So this is a ribbon here. And imagine that you take a little piece of that ribbon, like this little face here, and you put it inside a microscope, and you attach some leads to it, and you put current through it. And when you do that, this very beautiful pattern with all these lines, these are the edges, shows up. and and um, this is a, 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 a zoom of this, so you could see atomic, sort of atomic resolution. And you could see, I'm following. The green is not real. That green is put in by us. Everything else is the um, image. So this shows you the zigzag um, morphology. And this one shows you the armchair. You can watch where the atoms are doing. You can see armchair and zigzag. So uh, we can make nice edges now. And, but we're just at the infancy. We can't do this 
and give you the sample yet. But they form are these arrays. That's, and that the arrays are different layers. So we have a layer that makes one edge, and the next layer makes the next edge. And they're all staggered like cards. You know when you're dealing cards, they get scattered, staggered? And that's what we're seeing there. So now looking to the future. Uh, I gave a, a kind of a lecture on, on these uh, ribbons. And, and, and this afternoon, people had many questions about it. So I like them, too. Now, uh, looking to the future, I, I just have two, two view graphs, because uh, I was asked to look into the future. Uh, uh, I think Segre, uh, Fermi was always looking into the future. And he taught us how to look into the future. So I, I, Segre must have been looking into the future, too, part of his her heritage. So um, I'm thinking about all these carbon nanostructures. Synthesis is our biggest problem. It still remains a main focus. For nanotubes, we can't uh, at will generate the chiralities. We can't make metallic, only metallic tubes or only semiconducting tubes. We're getting close, but we can't really do that very well yet. So that remains a, a, um, a challenge. Very recently, uh, this is an idea that Smalley had that uh, we should try this technique of cloning. So you, suppose you take a nanotube, you grow it, and then you chop it up into 10 pieces. And you take each of those pieces and use it as a seed to grow others. Imagine that. That was his concept. Well, they, during his lifetime, they didn't actually manage to make that work, but got close. And since he died, uh, people have uh, done it. And with this fancy microscope that, that you people have, this aberration correction microscope, uh, um, GMA, and I think also here at Berkeley, uh, uh, people have demonstrated that you can take two NM, where NM have the same chiralities, in the microscope and join, heat them, and they join perfectly. You can't, do any, you can't join any other nanotubes. But if they have the same chirality, you can join them. So that's the first step. Or, or a complementary step to doing uh, with the cloning of growing from cutting them up. And there's some progress that's been made with that. So uh, uh, for the graphene, we, that's a big problem. Right now, the best way is scotch tape method, which is call it mechanical cleaving. You start with an HOPG sample, and you just lift off layers and try to get single layers. And that doesn't make very large uh, layers, and you can't make them where you want. So that's uh, a big challenge. And people are now making, uh, by CVD, the beginnings of a controlled growth of graphene. It's not really great yet, but it's very promising. So I imagine one, two years we'll, we'll be there with, with big sections where we want it. So that's close. Now what people say, and I, uh, I I was at a graphene um, week, and they had a lot of experts from around the world there. And I think there was a consensus that if we can make better graphene samples, we can understand the Dirac point. That right now, the experiments are just not good enough to get close enough to understand what's happening in detail at the Dirac point. And the people that were there, especially the theorists, thought that there were uh, unknown mysteries yet to be revealed about this direct point, if we can get closer to it and have better experiments. People, there, it, several groups were making uh, samples with uh, mobilities of 200,000 now. Um, and it, w what we need is 2 million. And we have to be like uh, galley marcinite. And maybe when we're in that range, uh, we'll be uh, seeing some new physics. So that's not far away, uh, probably, in five years for 2 million and uh, something new coming from that. So characterization, we have these aberration correction microscopes. Uh, you have some of those here. You're one of the unique places in the world to have those. And with that, you can, um, so this is an example of uh, distinguishing between C60 and C70 inside of a nanotube. You can do that. You can see these endofullerenes, fullerenes that have other things inside. You can detect them, find out what's in them. You can have little wires inside the, the, the nanotubes. All these wonderful things can be seen with these aberration correction, uh, uh, high-resolution TM. This is going to be really good. 
Um, one thing that we don't have yet, people have been doing combination of high resolution TEM and Raman, but what we need, and this is a good job for Berkeley, uh, uh, this has to be a national lab probably to do something like that, have enough money and resources, is to make a, micro, uh, um, a TEM that contains Raman inside, so you can do TEM and Raman at the same time on the same nanotube. Uh, I think that will be done somewhere, and so uh, this is a good project for you guys. I mean, the small universities uh, uh, otherwise can't do something like that, not easily, I think. So this is another thing. This last thing, um, they had a wonderful talk at Graphene Week on separation of charge and spin transport, and that seems to me like a real promising area for people to work in. Um, I don't know if anybody's doing exactly that here, but I, I think that's a good, uh, good challenge. So finally, my last few graphs, uh, applications. Um, this field now is getting to the point that there are really applications out there. Nanotubes have had an application for a long time as additives for lithium ion batteries. There are some 500 million of those are produced every year, and they, uh, uh, almost all of them contain nanotubes. And nanotubes make them increase the lifetime by a factor of two or three. And so it's a very good investment uh, for a battery. If you go for hardly any increase in cost, lifetime has increased that much. So that's done by nanotubes. And because nanotubes will come back to the same length and, and, and size. Um, uh, nanotubes and graphene both make wonderful transparent electrodes. And they have businesses now. And that, that will replace uh, indium tin oxide in a short time. So people uh, working, like for solar cells and so on, you like indium tin oxide. So we, we're going to need that for solving our energy situation. And we have good, cheap materials that do much better than indium tin oxide. So that, that's a good thing. Um, chemical and biosensors. I, so here's a, a schematic of a, of a sensor. And a, a bunch of different nanotubes. NTO8, we had very, some very nice talks on this. So you have the, the nanotubes at the percolation limit. They're very sensitive to even one atom of, of uh, 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 some kind of uh, gas species. It was kind of amazing. Um, muscle actuators, um, so artificial muscles. That'd be good for people have, having accidents. Or um, you can uh, build tissues, uh, uh, human tissues, around nanotubes and then put them in people to regenerate uh, limbs or, or nerves or whatever. So that's work that's under development, very promising. Nanohorns. So these little things, that, this is a GEMAS thing, but it really works both for the um, uh, um, uh, uh, ionic uh, systems, um, uh, inorganics, um, like for uh, energy uh, applications. Or you could have um, medicines that you can put in here and inject them in humans. They've been used for cancer uh, agents, for both, both of those, for uh, energy and um, medical applications. Uh, very promising things. So I think I've covered all of these things. This is for electronics. Maybe that's 10 years away, maybe 20 years away, but maybe that'll come someday. And then I end with two comments. Uh, metrology science for uh, nanostructures, we don't have it yet, but we're beginning to get an industry. And what's happened, I get phone calls every day about this. I don't know about the rest of you. And people uh, have trouble. They don't understand what's in their samples. Uh, and they don't know how to measure it, it's, and it's not trivial, and you really need a scientist. The engineers don't know the answers to this, and we have to help them, and we have to develop some kind of metrology science that, that helps us to know what's in a nanotube sample, what's in a graphene sample, and so forth, and all the other things, uh, silicon nanowires, you can just name it. So that's a, a, a new area that young people can work on and develop, so. And health effects. Now, we, we hope that all these things that we're working on are, are benign, but we know some of them, like cadmium telluride particles, aren't so benign. But if they're contained in something, then they don't get to us, so we're happy about it. But um, we have to be careful with all these different nanostructures that some of them are, are, can be, might be toxic, and so we have to use them in the right way if they're toxic so they don't harm us. 
So we, we, this is another field that, that needs to be developed. It's the sort of interdisciplinary field that needs uh, physics kind of people and understand what we're doing, how we use this, and understand the difference between uh, one sample and another, and medical people can't understand that. So it's a, uh, it requires that sort of cross-fertilization. So this thing is kind of developing. I don't know if what you're doing about that here, but this is a great project for national labs. Um, and more than individual investigators. But uh, anyway, that's my, my final thing, and, and thank you for listening to me. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was a lot of content with a lot of interesting futures. Uh, questions from the audience? I hope I wasn't uh, too technical about this. I tried to keep the technical content somewhat down. I have to say this is the first time I've heard that um, I didn't realize that people were using carbon nanotubes in in ion in, in um, you said in in lithium ion in batteries. Lithium -ion batteries. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you know, intercalation compounds. It, it's a very simple concept. Intercalation compounds. Something goes in, and then the, uh, the lattice expands, and then when the something comes out, so that's the charging process, and then the discharging process. That ion has to come out, and then we get a contraction. So when you expand and contract, <clears throat> everything has to fit perfectly on the, on the cycle. And it doesn't fit perfectly. There's some rearrangement of atoms. And a battery goes, I don't know, 10,000 times of charging and discharging before you throw it away. So um, increasing the life is done by having a little help that when it expands and contract, it, it always does it the same way. You have a little ratchet that straightens out and bends along with the charge and discharge. That's what the nanotube does. There's nothing else that has a resiliency of a carbon nanotube. So it's a unique property. Um, how do you make graphene out of a diamond? Oh. Uh, it's very, if this is very simple. This is my uh, Enrico Fermi type uh, explanation. You'll understand it completely. Uh, um, a graphite is the ground state, right? Graphene is, and graphite is the ground state. And diamond is an excited state. So heating, um, uh, diamond is in a metastable state. So if you get it over the potential barrier by heating it a little bit, then it becomes graphite. This is well known for years and years. So you just try that. The thing about nano diamond is that um, people make that synthetically now in large quantities for tools. So there's a lot of nano diamond around. You just take a little bit of that cheap stuff and you heat it and you get a, a small section that's a micron or so in size. And that uh, makes, uh, the reference is Afun. Uh, 2001 shows you how to make that. I'll give you the reference if you want. You can make it too. Uh, in terms of the graphene for nano ribbons, when n becomes small, you only have a few ribbons. Um, isn't there a problem? Yeah. Isn't there a problem that if there are so few atoms, you're, the entire thing just becomes a surface problem? I mean, in terms of apl applica uh, applicability. I mean, if you have very few ribbons, then all you have is our surface states everywhere. And if you want to make it into a device or anything, you're not really going to have any um, conductance along it. Well, that's not exactly true. And I think Steve Louie is one of the experts about uh, what. Um, it, it turns out, because of the special relation of K and K prime, there's no backscattering. So uh, a graphene sheet has very different properties than any other sheet. The absence of backscattering, as far as I know, only occurs in graphene. I don't know any other material that has that particular property. So um, it, it, um, that is um, usually a, a, a surface of any material X has uh, an oxide film. It has 
all kind of stuff. Um, graphene and nanotubes, if you heat treat them a little bit to, to uh, get rid of the um, uh, gas atoms, and 800 degrees C or so, which is a very benign temperature for carbon because carbon, uh, 2,000 degrees is a low temperature for carbon. So uh, a relatively modest temperature, you get rid of all of that surface stuff, and you can get uh, an atomic uh, surface. That is, for, for surface science, uh, graphene and nanotubes are uh, the cat's meow. It's their, an ideal uh, surface science material. You have specular reflection. You have all kind of things that you don't have in other systems. So you have to think about this in a totally different way. And, and there are other, other aspects. Oh, there's, there's me in, in 19, uh, when I started working on carbon science. I don't want to have myself. <laughs> My students like that picture of me. Uh, I was once young, too. Yeah. Uh, but um, the, uh, the carbon materials really have very anisotropic properties, like nothing else. You know, like electrical conductivities tend to the sixth in anisotropy. Thermal conductivity is 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4th in anisotropy. The other materials just don't have those kind of ratios. So one direction, it's, uh, it's metallic. In the other case, it's semiconducting. It's a barrier, OK? So you have, you have all kind of reflection for the phonons and the electrons. It just behaves different than anything else. I mean, I, I knew this in my youth when I started with this. And, and uh, I was always amazed about uh, it was a great thing for teaching students, because every material, every property was something new, a challenge, because it wasn't like anything else they'd seen before. So you had to re-examine everything that you ever learned and your physics course. I don't know if I've answered my question, but it's a great, a great material for surface science. And um, it's only surface. It's all you have. There's only one layer. Everything is surface. But it's an ideal surface. Could be ideal. Hi. So uh, uh, in graphene, people talk about Dirac fermions because of the linear dispersion. Um, how come there's no discussion of that in a, a nanotube where that passes through the K points? Well, uh, yeah, it, we, you have something. You have curvature. And curvature is, is breaking. Well, you know, we have a similar kind of thing with, with, uh, um, with nanotubes. So how do I answer that question, Steve? Uh, we have something. Uh, we have something that's uh, kind of similar to that, but um, but we're missing some of the symmetry because of the curvature effect. So that's what I can say about that. See, we. Uh, we have a spinner. We have spin up and spin down. And we have that also in, in, um, in nanotubes, uh, which make up the doublet. For, and we have two things. We have the spin up and spin down. And we have K and K prime. And we have that both for nanotubes, and we have it for graphene. So we have four different uh, uh, things that we have, should consider. So we should have four by four Hamiltonian if we consider all of those together. Spin orbit interaction is pretty weak. But we know now that it's uh, pretty important uh, for many things that we observe in nanotubes, so we can't ignore it. But the magnitude of the spin-orbit interaction is, uh, for graphite is 10 to the minus it, three orders of magnitude from one. It's very, very tiny. But because it's one dimension, it makes it big. The effect is, is very much uh, enhanced. And all kinds of, uh, Steve is now working on, on uh, screening effects. That's also very, very different in one dimension. All these things are different in one dimension. I think we'll take one, take one last question and then. Thank you. What steps do you think need to be taken to further assess occupational exposure in the lab for different synthesis processes? 
what steps need to be taken to improve synthesis? No, to um, understand how different researchers may be exposed through occupational exposure while oh. synthesizing in the lab. What research do you feel is really important at this point in time? Well, okay. Uh, well, the first thing is to be cautious and work under a hood. And um, every, well, l let me just explain my, my, my approach to it. When I did my PhD thesis, I did it in the same area that the first nuclear reactor was developed in, in the world. The Fermi pile was uh, uh, developed in my lab. And they didn't tear it down. We were working there. And uh, I, I, I'm still alive and didn't really apparently kill me, but it could have. And you know, we were using all these chemicals that now are, are hazardous, according to OSHA and so forth. So I, I would say that 50 years ago or so, when I was doing my PhD thesis, we were doing all kind of uh, hazardous things without knowing it. And, so, so my, and I survived, but not everybody in my cohorts. I mean, there were a number of people, uh, either my age group or a little bit older than me, that did survive because they were more susceptible to these things than peasants like me. So I, I got th through. But uh, we, we have to have a safety standards that protect the average person or maybe the less strong person with natural immunities. And we should consider all of these uh, thing, new things that we don't know anything about as potentially hazardous until proven that they're OK. So we just take you know, common things, wash your hands when you're in the lab, uh, uh, change your, your clothes uh, uh, frequently, so vapors don't, again, you know, stuff like that. Uh, just take uh, common precautions that chemistry labs uh, uh, teach students how to, to do. Uh, these are just, chemists tell me that uh, um, they feel comfortable that if you take these precautions, you're probably okay, even though we don't know in precisely the toxicity level. But for most things, the um, uh, toxic agents are contained inside something, and it's very unlikely that you get, have any personal exposure to them if you work under a hood, because they're contained in something they're not flying around in the air. Uh, but I, I'm just saying that historically, uh, since I, I was working in a very hazardous place, and I didn't know it, and nobody knew it. I mean, we were just treating it like you know everyday business, and it wasn't, as later found out. Uh, so, okay, I don't know if that answers. Uh, you just be cautious about things and just use common sense and 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 act as if. Uh, uh, that maybe it isn't uh, uh, as benign as you think. OK, well, I think it's getting late. Probably everybody, yeah, we're all, including we're getting, our speaker, all getting would tired. like our, our din her, her dinner, our dinner. So let's thank our speaker again.